So we're recording now. Uh, let me just put you on full screen. So this is the PyScript Fun. Uh, what's PyScript Fun? It's where people get together and imagine there's a virtual water cooler and we're all by the water cooler and someone goes, hey, do you want to see something fun that I've been hacking on? And you go, oh, all right then, come on then. And you wander over to their desk and they show you the thing and you go, wow, that's fun or that's cool and you learn something or uh, you, you get a little insight into their world or, or you learn a little bit more about PyScript. So uh, we're going to have three uh, presentations today, or three aspects to this PyScript fun. The first one is going to be Andrea, who's up there, according to my screen. Uh, Andrea is going to tell us all about how awesome Safari is. Uh, then immediately above me uh, is Josh, who's going to explain all about donkeys. Um, and then Martin <laughs> and I are going to uh, talk a little bit about the when decorator um, I've implemented a version of what we discussed over on the issue uh, but there are further thoughts and perhaps we could have a little bit of a debate with those of us in this room um, and those uh, watching at home can also take part on the issue which I'll make sure I link to as well so without further ado uh, how's Safari Andrea okay thank you very much um, I'll try to share my screen and uh so there is an issue that uh, I cannot. Oh, you know, yep. um, there's an issue that I cannot reproduce in WebKit, which is WebKit is the uh, open source engine behind Safari. But there is this Safari 16.4 that does something weird with a, a, a JavaScript module resolution. Um, so here you can see a basic HTML page that is, it has a module, in our case it would be the PyScript module, in this case it's AJS, um, in our case it's core, maybe I should have named this file better, um, AJS um, imports something lazily from, the, from BJS um, it exports something. So this is our core. We are exporting uh, utilities, including hooks and whatnot. So utilities that can be used from lazily imported modules down the road. And uh, and then we have uh, lazy then, uh, which it, which which means lazy was lazy thing whatever it is so we see from BJS what's lazy it's importing a module in this case is CJS because we we already we already imported A A is importing B and B is importing lazily remember lazily CJS then whatever it does it doesn't matter it doesn't really matter so the graph, the synchronous graph, is that from our page we imported synchronously AJS. AJS exports synchronously something, which is this result value, which is okay. It could have been named anything else. It doesn't matter. So this is a synchronous module. It doesn't matter what it does. It exports synchronously without even awaiting anything. The result okay and this is our core module it, it never awaits anything it's just synchronous um, it exports stuff then while it's parsing the logic around um, like lazy some lazy import that imported lazily meaning asynchronously something else uh, while it's parsing stuff it does more but the reason we in core, we, we export things and we import lazy things is to, first of all, avoid, avoid blocking. And secondly, is to avoid um, uh, uh, cross references in terms of modules resolutions, because core is a file apart, lazy is lazily loaded whatever module it is and it can import from core because core is already defined as being synchronous and so on and so forth so b is doing something probably weird for safari is awaiting something before exporting something and i don't know details because this is really really a safari only bug not webkit not chrome not chromium 
not Firefox, not nothing. It's just a very specific Safari bug. At some point, um, if the lazy loaded module tries to import something from the original, um, and this is, you, you might say this is circular dependency issue. But the thing is that ECMAScript or JavaScript modules are fully capable of solving circular dependencies issues because they don't have an issue when you import lazily because you import um, <clears throat> synchronously something if that synchronously later on import lazily whatever you already defined it doesn't matter it works and that's how it should be but not in safari 16.4 uh, and so yeah um, basically this is a uh, surely technical but this is as important imagine here the PyScript core PyScript core is importing um, uh, plugins and in this case uh, B is a plugin is a list of plugins and lazy plugins get get loaded lazily and then in our PyScript core we just export stuff we expect that lazy resolution to happen after the C is imported by the um, by the plugin the C itself is importing something from a back to core and so this works in every browser but Safari does something weird and it does something weird only as far as you know in 16.4 it's also super hard to test properly Safari because it's not WebKit, so I cannot test it on my Linux machine. And I had to like uh, resume it, um, Mac Mini from 2014, which fortunately has the latest Safari, but it doesn't have the latest tools to let me help to, to help me debugging the issue. So long story short, this has been fixed. Basically, we moved everything from uh, from core. <clears throat> this doesn't happen anymore. So this basically is uh, delayed in some functionality. We have some functionality. Before it was done to bootstrap all plugins as soon as possible. Right now is behind some function in it. And then that's when it happens. <clears throat> and when that happens, lazy. It's not anymore a, a direct um, promise, is rather uh, an asynchronous thing. And so from B is not export const lazy import, is going to be export from lazy import. So this delays uh, in core whatever we are doing. And so when we invoke lazy at the right time and we are sure that nothing is blocking our core, then it always works, even in Safari. And that's it. That's uh, I don't know if this was clear because ABC are not the best name for files I, I could think of. Um, but at the same time, this is the thing. So moving from import as soon as possible from import whenever the core is, is, is actually a module defined in time, um, that solved the issue, and I, can, I could not reproduce the issue about Safari complaining about some promises not being resolved. And also, last fun fact, fun, um, it was only when you excluded some plugin, because when you exclude some plugin, Safari somehow faster at resolving things. But again, this is some Safari internal stuff that I don't understand and what you're seeing here is my attempt to try to reproduce um, an issue and file a bug to Safari or WebKit yeah. uh, WebKit again doesn't does does the job WebKit my WebKit on Linux um, even the WebKit preview never has an issue and so I think something weird in Safari 16.4 landed but we want to be sure that everyone can run our stuff in both yeah. Safari and uh, and uh, WebKit. Have you, yeah. is, 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 there a, is, is there a Safari uh, bug, um, you know, 
bug bug page where you know maybe other people have have seen this because uh, uh, and, uh, so I, I I try to look for for a specific bug for a, a module resolution, but the thing is that this bug came up after the latest Safari update. Yeah. So I expect people to be surprised, and I also expect not many modules out there are using the indirect pattern so we we know we have dependencies but dependencies are lazy and dependencies yeah. can, can can grab stuff from the core running those dependencies so yeah. we we have this circular dependency but because we, we we want to know up front how many plugins we can offer yeah and we want to provide the ability to run any plugin as soon as possible and those plugins should be able from the core functionality to say, okay, I'm a plugin, I'm doing this, 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 and that. Yeah. So the architecture was there. The bootstrap timing was decided to be the fastest possible. It works everywhere in Safari, unfortunately. And and also it's hard to rep to um, to provide for me a valid or a very simple use case where Safari fails right now because our stack is a bit complex mm -hmm. and we have synchronous resolution uh, resolved modules behind the scene and i think that's something that might not add to the way of safari resolution but at the same time if every other browser is doing it right i'm not yeah. expecting this it, it's easy. the fact that there's a mismatch it's between yeah yeah it's yeah. the mismatch between webkit which is the the parent uh, uh, you know uh, safari uses webkit as its engine so exactly. what, what what on earth are they doing with safari which is why i thought well it feels to me like they've introduced a bug yeah. because there's a difference in behavior and you know since safari is a closed source apple product you know how do you report this back to apple i mean this is the this is the other thing so um last comment for me i said it in other venues yeah. Safari is the webkit, what Chrome is to Chromium. Yes. There are things in both Safari and Chrome that are nowhere available or, or not part of the same code, yeah. webkit and Chromium. But this was a clear example of something I could not reproduce. Webkit latest and webkit uh, stable in nowhere. Yeah. Even if the user agent string is always the same, it's, yeah. it's, it's just I couldn't reproduce it. And uh, I'm, I'm, I must apologize because it took it took a while for me to understand what would die, what, mm. what was going on. Yeah, 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 uh, yeah. I had to set up a proper um, Apple only machine and, and 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 finally being able to at least see the arrow. Yeah. And uh, and and debug and, and and understand. Okay. Yeah. This is something. And I and also <clears throat> last apology is that. I publish in the meantime <laughs> to be able to test that stuff <laughs> oh, yeah. I, as soon as he as he went live um, I, I've published a lot of um, uh, minor patches for for PyScript in uh, in NPM yeah. but at the same time you shouldn't care about yeah PyScript on NPM because what we ship is this final stable yes, thing yes um, at the same time NPM is the uh, let's say uh, Wild West or, uh, yeah, <laughs> Wild West Discovery Channel, or yeah. Canary Channel, or um, Dev Channel, and it's, it's not meant to be stable. Sometimes you can see logs. Yeah. Sometimes, but that helps us to to, to test stuff. Yeah. Live as well from different uh, browsers too. Yeah. And through PyScript.com. Yeah. So. So thanks to really thanks to me. Russell, thanks to Russell for for, for noticing that uh, you know that that this yeah, was absolutely. was absolutely. actually happening, and appreciate the fact that he took the time to. To give us all the information that was needed to to, to fix that. Cool. Okay. It but it was uh, it was fun to find the solutions. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's always good, isn't it? When especially a a, a tricky, gnarly, uh, hard to debug situation where you've literally not yeah. got the hardware in the house apart from some then, some ancient thing. Um. Okay. So. Uh. Okay. Uh. Next we have uh. Drum roll. Donkey. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> Josh, tell us about your donkey. Has it got a name? It just, it just not other than donkey. Donkey. Like Shrek character. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm going to have to do it in five minutes somehow. Um, that'll be quick. Uh, all right. 
Is this going to work? There we go. Okay. There we go. Yeah. So this is the edge blocks editor, which runs high script. Uh, not that one. This one. Um, ha hang on. Ha uh, uh, but we we can see. We can just see your browser. Um, yes, that's right. That's all we're supposed to see. Okay, it's just you yeah. went not that one, this one, and nothing changed for us. So I, I changed the browser tab, but oh. they look the same. Oh, right. Okay. All right. I didn't so notice. That, that'll be why. My apologies. Um, okay. Just wanted to check. No, it's fine. Yeah. So um, the current process is you drag a block, right, and it generates some code, and then you press the run button, and then it's going to upload files to Google Cloud. It all bootstrap the PyDi interpreter and then it will run. That takes about like five seconds and I have a uh, fairly good internet connection, Ethernet, all this sort of stuff. So it, it, it's, um, imagine if you're on slow Wi-Fi, it's going to take about 10 or 15 seconds when you press the run button, yeah. um, which is less than ideal. Uh, so I thought, well, you have all this time, right, where you're drag and drop in the box. Why can't we do all the pie-dyed stuff in the background ready for when the user wants to press a run button. So I uh, messaged Andrea a few weeks ago to say, hey, can we come up with a nice way in JavaScript to start up a pie-dyed worker that is basically just ready to receive code? And uh, within about a day or so, I had a post type of this donkey to, to uh, basically live up to my dream of instant code execution using PyScript. Um, and we got 90% of the way there. Um, I can't remember if I demoed this or not. Um, I can't remember if I did. So um, essentially, it would um, start off PyDi worker in the background. You'd press the run button, and it would instantly run. And then we had the problem of uh, something that I hadn't thought through of, well, if you introduce one of these things, what happens when you want to then uh, run some more code because it's not exactly killing the, yeah. uh, the, 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 the loop in the background that hasn't uh, finished. Uh, and then there was another refactor and then we landed on, uh, or say we, Andrea, landed on this implementation that we have now, which is pretty much perfect, which I'll now show. So if I refresh the uh, editor, um, you'll see that the run button sort of does a little spinny thing, and then when it goes to blue, it means that it's ready to run. So actually in the background, we now have a PyDide worker that is ready. Uh, so I can drag and drop my block onto the screen, press the run button, and you can see it's instant. Hello world. Bravo. And I can press stop. I can uh, add some exclamation marks in there, press run, and it's instant again. Or if I want to uh, introduce um, a loop, for example, uh, do that so it doesn't spam the terminal. Yeah. Uh, I can press run, and it's going to do the thing there. Forever and ever but and ever and ever. Forever, and it will just carry on. But obviously, when I press stop, what happens if I now want to update the code and rerun? So what it's going to do is, in the background, it's going to check, oh, I need to kill that previous worker and start up a new one and you can see it's done that in the background kill the, the donkey kill the donkey kill the donkey uh, press run it's going to be ready to accept code yeah so you can see how much quicker it is now that we're not having to restart up PyDi upload files to Google yeah. Cloud all the time yeah it's ready to go whenever we need it yeah so, and, and in the background these files are still being saved to Google Cloud but that's a kind of an nope. asynchronous don't need to Okay, but how? Uh, okay, so I've I've done my project, and I go back to my mm. dashboard. Where's where's my where's my source code stored then? Oh, the source code is yes, yes, so the blocks source code, and yes, but we're not. Um, we've removed a step where we're uploading like our index.html. Yeah, all of that, all of that jazz. That. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, because it wasn't really needed. Yeah. Um, yeah, awesome. But I could still do, um, I could still publish my app, in which case those assets are going to be created in the background somewhere so I can share my URL and then Grandma can go and look at my Hello World app. Uh, yeah. So it's still um, there, yeah. So, yeah, so I'm thinking about maybe we can do like an optional like export. Yeah. Of, 
export website or pu- publish website. or something. Yeah, yeah. publish. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and maybe that uh, uses like the uh, PyScript.com stuff rather yeah. than me having to host all that. Yeah, offload it to to, to PyScript.com sounds like a great idea. Yeah. Um, Martin, did that you have your hand up? Work. I, I did. Yeah, yeah. go so for it. Just a, a little. Yeah, that's awesome, Josh. Obviously, it's instantaneous, and um, there's a slight oddity, oddity maybe for a user though, which is so if you run this, run this code. If you click the run button, mm-hmm. then there's a stop button. Yes, that's a UX thing I need to figure out. Yeah, because <laughs> yeah. it's like uh, as a user, I'm like, what? It should have stopped. Yeah. <laughs> that needs to change to like so, so essentially what that stop button is doing right is it's like closing the output so I was going to say could it be close close yeah it, it it's in a bit of a strange location right because like well what are you closing right as far as, as, far as I'm a user right all, all I've done is say run this code this code should run to completion and then I'm like yeah but with the while loop the stop made perfect sense yeah yeah exactly yeah. oh yeah for the, yeah I, I understand that right this is the interesting thing right the while loop it makes sense but for the print hello world case it's it's kind of like hmm that's interesting I this, don't know do, you, do you know what this reminds me of it reminds me of Windows 95 where they had a start menu and how do you stop the computer well you go to the start menu <laughs> then you click stop <laughs> The donkey has a has a horizon. Okay, donkey, come on. Um, no, I agree with Martin. So if if it's completed, probably it should go to back to run again, and uh, and the stop should be for the case where it didn't, it never stopped, uh, like the one loop or anything. So yeah, but Josh, you probably know, or maybe. <laughs> or maybe you don't. <laughs> In that case, I, I need to fix something. Um, you probably know when the when the program run and um, mm-hmm. time. You don't you don't need to stop it because you can run it again and maybe just yeah. change some like um, add some exclamation mark and run again. And you don't need to stop and run again. You just run again because the previous program stopped. And so yeah. I, I agree with Martin. It's easy though, right? We just take a bit of source code and determine whether it finishes or not. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, okay. yeah but, okay, yes. Uh, okay, okay. It sounds like that. But if there was an input, mm-hmm. for instance, the, the stop yeah. still makes sense. So yes. it's, oh, it's, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's like it, it, if you're gonna wait and the thing didn't 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 finish running, then you can show stop. If the thing finished running, um, and you can add a, a then somewhere in JavaScript uh, or catch, uh, and uh, it should go back to run. Uh, yeah, I think yeah. It's, a, so, so, it's a minor detail, but it's great for the X. Uh, if the donkey, I, is, I, I need to run. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Josh, you take Sorry, care. But I misscheduled a meeting. It's my fault. Okay. All right. Do you agree right. with anything we said? Yes. Okay. I, I, I will. I will come back to the next one with uh, the improvement. Fantastic. Fantastic. All right. You okay. take care, Josh. Catch Thank you, Josh. Um, so, so, so for those for those following at home, um, uh, Martin's joke would make sense to computer scientists who are familiar with the halting problem, which I think Turing asked, how can you tell if a computer program will ever stop? Well, the only way you can tell is by actually running it and seeing. Um, so, uh, and it's a kind of like a fundamental paradoxical problem in the, at the heart of, of computer science it, so. it, it's not paradoxical i think but uh, yeah it's, it's a great well it, it's paradoxical and, and you say how can you tell well by doing it is the only way uh you, you know there's yeah. it, it's there's no way of actually external to the universe of computing have a look at thing at a thing and go yep that'll finish uh you know um but uh, oh he's back like my I, 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 as you were saying, Josh, what was it? <laughs> I had to, I had to, I had to, um, I locked myself out of um, some IT systems. They just had to check it was me who wanted it resetting. 
and it took all of 30 seconds, so I am back. Oh, right. Okay. Well, you missed the world's funniest joke about computer science. You'll just have to watch this yeah. this back uh, on on replay. Um, so, <laughs> any more questions for... If only the um, the donkey was winnable, you could say like while it's executing, then kids then show the stop button, and then when it's when it's finished executing, take the stop button away. Yeah, that is a great segue into. <laughs> <laughs> I want to know if that that donkey has been bought specifically for this meeting. Oh, it's violas. <laughs> oh, that makes more sense. That's my my daughter's favorite donkey. <laughs> She's she's in the next room screaming, looking for her donkey now. <laughs> also, 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 you don't kill a donkey. Yeah. Because I call the the orchestrator of the donkey a farmer. So eventually you kill a farmer. Ah, right. Okay. <laughs> it's more animal friendly. You know? That yeah. makes sense. That makes sense. <laughs> okay. Talking of when, this is the third bit, which Martin and I can do um i think perhaps if i talk through where we've got to so i can set a bit of context i can show you the solution that i created given the test suite that uh, that we wrote to represent the current state of the discussion then martin perhaps you can uh talk a little bit about your thoughts and give the examples that that you you briefly demoed to me earlier on today uh, i could share a few of my thoughts that martin already knows about because you know we shared that earlier on and then it would be lovely to have you know your opinions feedback and uh, i feel that if we can nail this down we're very close to getting when delivered um a large part of this is that i'm looking at the implementation that i've currently done and there's an all sorts of kind of like ifs you know conditionals in there which i don't think we need if we can be canny about the way that we design our API um, uh, and I think 10 lines of Python simple Python is a lot better than you know the the solution that, that we we might have right now so what I'm going to do is I'm going to share my screen um, and then I'll, I'll move you around as well screen one go live okay so I'm moving you over to that um, uh, monitor is what it's called and you should be looking at oops uh, you should be looking at um, Visual Studio can you see that fine mm -hmm. okay so this is PyScript and if we go look at the uh, uh, tests that I created uh, in test when uh, so um, essentially we are what we want to try and do is make it easy for Pythonistas who are useful, who are used to working in the synchronous world of Python, to react to things in the asynchronous world of JavaScript and the browser. And for that to happen, uh, we want this notion of when something happens, then do this other thing. So this other thing is uh, a function or a handler or something like that. And uh, We've discussed this, and one of the things that we've been talking about is actually creating a protocol uh, based around Dunder when, which is what you can see here. This is a test class, by the way, so it's not an actual real example. You know, the class is my whenable, and it's a simple whenable object that can be triggered. And this is uh, this is triggering the object. Okay, and what does Dunder when uh, take? It takes a handler with some args and quags. Um, and then it just sets them. And when the event is triggered, uh, if there is a handler, then it creates a result. These are all um, sort of implementation specific for what the behavior of this class is. The important thing is, is that I can uh, call under when um, with a handler so that when the trigger is called uh, as an implementation detail, um, the handler is called with some sort of a result. Okay, so like it says here, these are implementation details depending on the sort of thing the winnable object represents. This is just a numpty example. So I'm creating a winnable here. I'm creating a counter here. And now I'm going to use the when decorator here. So when some winnable happens, um, and then I've got some arguments and keyword arguments as well, uh, then what I want is for that winnable, when that is triggered, uh, to be handled by this foo um, function uh, and it takes a result and what's that result going to be well it's going to be 
this result because the implementation details of this particular winnable are that it will take the args and the quags um, and I'm going to then be able to say well uh, I'm going to increment the counter by one and then I'm going to assert because this is a unit test that I'm getting the foo and the bar from the arguments and I'm going to get the baz equals quarks from the quags as well okay um, so I assert in my unit test that the counter is zero then I trigger it and then I assert the counter is one, thus proving that this function has actually been called and these assertions have actually passed. OK, so that's using the when decorator. Um, uh, but I can also create a winnable class. This is basically the same class. But uh, because um, this might be uh, being used in a dynamic way, uh, so I want to actually um, assign uh, the when uh, after um, something's been drawn or something has been created I want to say I want to instead of using it as a um, function decorator I want to use it just as a function call so when the winnable uh, happens I want to pass in a handler and then the arguments and the quarks uh, and then the same tests happen again um, ensuring that I get the results okay so the tests that you see here reflect the current state of the discussion over on GitHub. Um, and so what I've done is, um, is created a uh, when uh, that behaves in this sort of a way. OK, um, and uh, we can see that it actually works uh, because I can run the test suite. Um, uh, we can if I actually find where my terminal is. So I can do make test. Okay, and ah, ah, of course it won't work uh, because um, I'm giving a demo. <laughs> I have no idea what's going on there. Oh, well, never mind. It was working until a few minutes ago. Anyway, uh, the important thing is that uh, the tests uh, now pass when when uh, is called. Now, the implementation details are a bit weird uh, because I need to work out if there's a handler and then I want to know whether the target that's been passed in uh, has a dunder when. And if it has, if it doesn't, then it needs to behave like when used to behave, where I used to be able to pass in the name of a uh, an event, like click, and then a CSS selector to select a button, for example, in a DOM, uh, uh, in the DOM. Um, so that's what all this is doing. And then, of course, uh, I'm defining the decorator here that's taking a function, either the function that's being decorated or the handler um, that I'm going to call down here so if you have a handler call decorator with the handler otherwise return the decorator because we're decorating a function uh, but in here we have all these gubbins uh, which is about okay I'm not, I want my handler uh, to optionally take an argument uh, representing the context um, and honestly I don't know why we do that uh, you know um, I, I want to know I, I, I know people might well, anyway, I, I think we. The thing is, we do we do that because, say, for example, I'm wiring up a handler for a on a button, and I say click on on some ID hashtag, yeah. you know, stop nuclear reactor button. I don't need the event. Uh, no, I've got, all, I've got I've got all I I've got all I need because I know that all I'm actually interested in is there's a click on the stop the nuclear reactor button. Yes, I know. But the way the underlying browser works is that there was there is always an event that uh, gives you the context of that particular uh, occurrence happening, and uh, what we do. I'm just looking at all of this, and there's a to yeah, do, and there's a thing, and then a blah, and I'm like, well, why don't you just say all event handlers? just take a result and that's it you can you could ignore it if you want i can imagine the only thing thing is i mean to be honest it's fine by me right if yeah. that was the decision there's going to be some backward compatibility issues right because if you've hooked up your event handlers that don't take an event yeah with when in the past then they're all going to break 
Yeah, exactly. So if we were to document this um, uh, and, and warn people that this is happening, then... Because I, I, I pretty much, on a lot of... Well, actually, I'm just thinking, actually, by habit, I think I do type events. That's yeah. just because I'm a bit of a geek. But on a lot of the things, I don't ever need it, right? It's yeah. just... Yeah. Oh, you may you may not need it, but often you may. And there and remember, we might be handling events from APIs uh, that are actually returning results. Uh, you know, for instance, right. the text to speech or something like that, or speech to text. You know, wh whatever it is, you're going to get some some result, a geolocation or something. And so it, it feels to me like you need to kind of when something happens, I kind of want to know what the result of that happening might be even though uh, I might not need that all of the time if you see what I mean uh, it just it essentially it feels like all this code yeah most of the code in that decorator I can do work, that is to work is to do with working out in a interpreter agnostic way whether or not your function takes an argument or not yeah and honestly you should just say it takes an argument okay um, and well, and then and true. then uh, and then we just have these lines of code, which is simple it's to reason about. Potentially, right? Because there's two things from the user's perspective. Maybe I don't care. Like, like I said, I, pretty much every button click, I never care about what it is because I've given my button something. Uh, unless I've got a single handler for a group of buttons, mm. most most of the time, right? Most of my buttons have got IDs like submit or uh, yeah. add. add Add a widget, delete a widget, uh, you know, and so... So so here's the thing. You say most of the time I've just got one button, but we do actually allow people to have CSS selectors, and that's one of the kind of the features. That's what this block of code well, is yeah, about. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, but my point is, right, if I say I've got a thing, like, for example, the, the example I'm about to show, right, I've yeah. got a subscribe message and unsubscribe buttons. Yeah. I could write a handler with a CSS selector that it it takes the clicks on all the buttons and then multiplex it from there, right? Yeah. Send it to the right place. Or I could do it the way that I've chosen to do it, which is I can actually just have a, when my um, subscribe button is clicked, when my message button is clicked, yeah, yeah. when my subscribe button oh, is yeah. clicked. And so I, so I don't need the events. And my, and my point is, the question is, how would you feel about that feature if there was a better if MicroPython supported the idea so that I could I could actually inspect the signature very easily and accurately as opposed to having to do all the trying and that would so so now suddenly you're adding two lines of code to check whether or not your function takes an argument rather than 15 uh, right. well I don't know I mean uh, I mean this is what you need to actually just in regular Python this is the well, that, that's the MicroPython bit there this is the this is well, if we had two, it's two different things though right one of it is signature inspection one is coroutine inspection one of it is checking out do i have arguments one is saying i am i am i a coroutine or not yeah well so, yeah. so so imagine that code from like line 85 down disappears because because we can do the same thing with inspect right suddenly that method doesn't quite look so ugly <laughs> well i don't know uh and, and <laughs> but like from a user's perspective, why, why do I have to declare an event argument? Because a, uh, my, a, I, my ID, my IDE is going to whinge at me that you haven't used the event argument, so I, I'm going to have to put a hashtag no QA at the end of every line that's of my uh, uh, event listeners. Uh, well, no, not necessarily. Um, I mean, the the. the Okay, so there's one good reason why you should, and that's because underlying the browser does. Okay, so if you're coming from the web world, uh, from JavaScript, uh, every event takes an argument. Uh, every event handler takes an argument, which is the event object. So all we're saying here is we're just going to drop it if you've not specified it. Uh, and I'm just saying, well... We could just kill all of this, actually, and just have that, which is right, a lot is a lot more readable. Um, right, but what, right, but what's so you're you're I I, I I like it's good, right? You're going for readability, yeah, of a of a small function, right? What yeah. about usability of that function? Like this function, we could 
we could split out like we could make this function readable but it's but what about the users of your function but the users only have to do something that look like this um, oh, for crying out loud. yeah yeah you just have to put events you just yeah. have to put event yeah. when you're not using it yes no I yeah I, yeah I get that um you know you're just doing that instead of that and even the AI thinks it needs a result. <laughs> uh, <laughs> which I find kind of interesting. But, uh, you know, it, it, yeah. So anyway, there, there, there's that. I, I, I want to make sure that we, I, I want you to demo your thing yes. as well. Because I, I, I also have a problem with, with all of this gumph up here. Uh, because yes. I think we could change this uh, into something that looks like um, oh, for God's sake what the hell's going on here right okay so we could have yep. something like event name target uh, winnable equals none uh, oops and then that and then we could start working from there, where the event name. But anyway, I, I'm going to stop sharing. Um, and I think Martin, you should share, and we can kind of see where we get to. So, so let's have a look at right. So one of the. Do you want to just increase the size as well, please? Oh uh, yeah, how do I do that? Uh, are oh, you in pie charm? No idea. It's it's control plus. Control plus. See, see awesome. in a pro, in a proper awesome. proper ID, this is really easy. So this is a real test. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, how good is it really? Come on, plus. Appearance. Appearance. Zoom. Go that command. Command plus. No. Not just. Control plus. Oh, control, control plus. Plus. Oh, no. So, folks, sure. welcome to the Pie Charm Show, where today we're going to be talking about zooming in and zooming out. <laughs> font size, font size at the bottom there. Down, 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 down. down. And next one along. No, yeah, down the bottom. There's a font size. I saw it. Can you install Linux? Uh, oh, maybe yeah. it's view. View. Is it view? View. Font size. Increase right, font size. Right, right. There we go. At the bottom. Four or five up from the bottom. Five up from the bottom. Great. <laughs> What's oh, that? It, what does that mean? Shift up arrow dot. That's that, a nice command one. Up. Command up, I think. Command, command up and command down. Command up. Hello? No. No. Oh, no. Uh, anyway. <laughs> Up. No. There we go. Is that big enough? Can you see that now? No, not really. Just uh, another another couple of notches up. Where was it again? View, increase. Bonus. That's it. And again, oh, one more, one more, one more, and we're there. There we go. Okay. I hope, hope I hope YouTube appreciates all the effort that's gone into making this readable now. <laughs> right. So one of the so the original goal of this right the original goal the reason for my original feature request was that we've got using PyWeb, right? I've got my button. Here's my little button sus subscriptions, right? When I click on the subscribe button, there's an, there's an event. <laughs> oh, yeah, exactly, right, which I don't, which I don't actually need. Right. You'll, you'll, no you'll notice that you my... Do, you do, you do in events. You you need an argument in the event because otherwise PyWeb is going to complain that the, <laughs> there was no... The, you, you define something that didn't expect the event. Oh, really? So we do need the event. Yeah. Well, that's that's what that code does. Is that it works around Pyodide expecting the event. So it's not by accident that you have event in there. Uh, that's what I'm saying. Uh, you can try right now and. Well, this is like <laughs> amazing. <laughs> but that's because you're using when, as in the old version of when that. Bodges, that 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 that, that, that bodges around it. 
Yeah. So yeah, if you describe I'm an event, eating, folks. the event is gonna receive an event. <laughs> Any handler is gonna receive an event. But not in a, not in PyScript, not in PyScript right now, right? But that that's the thing is that we're. In, in JavaScript, uh, and, and Pyodide is expecting that as well. That the the when allows you to do it without an argument. You defined underscore three times there, and so I don't know if that's gonna work. Uh, yeah, it makes I don't no know difference. What we are looking at. So the reason that I use underscore is for these is that there's nothing I can add. It doesn't matter. This this function gets wrapped. Right by the deck by yeah. the decorator. It might as well be anonymous. Yeah. It, it will receive an event. It will receive an event. That's for sure. Yeah. Well, no, it, well, but it doesn't because of the when, the, the our current implementation of when uh, does the check to see whether or not your function takes an argument and handles that for you. So that's currently the state of how it is in. But this is. Um, but this is why I want to. Uh, so for Andrea, for like your Andrea, I want to undo that so that. Yeah. You have to have an event, which is kind That's of what, what you Nicholas expected. Is, Nicholas is saying that this is. Um, That's the preferred way. Mandatory. Yeah. Mandatory. Yeah. Make yeah. it mandatory. But the thing is, for me, is like in this, I don't need it, right? If you make it mandatory, I have to do this. Do right. you? I, I, I'm gonna say. I'm gonna say. Event can be ignored in JavaScript handlers, so. I see what you're saying. If you don't care about the event and doing anything with it, maybe it should be optional, and that's probably that's probably correct. And if you hear noise from, <laughs> yeah, these. <laughs> uh, my daughter just came back. Missing her donkey, <laughs> maybe. Okay. Yeah, okay. Uh, let's go back to the technical discussion. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sorry. Um, so the uh, so the actually here I agree. If you if you want an event, you should have an event. If you don't want an event, because it doesn't matter. Uh, maybe for for developer experience uh, sake, you should not make the event mandatory because making arguments mandatory and then not using it. It, it becomes a bit ugly on the on, on developers' eyes. Um, so I don't I don't know, but uh, well, the, the current state of play is that we we this is the current state of play, right? Yeah. This is in production. We don't we don't make it mandatory at the moment. Yeah, that, that that's correct. But usually in JavaScript, when it comes to JavaScript listeners, event is always there. Is always there. So yeah. if if, yeah. It, if it makes sense to have it always there in Python two, I'm I'm okay with it. If, if it makes the developer experience worse because it's just I don't care about the event whatever that was because I already defined it by type and um, target. Then we we have um, I, I mean I, I can agree you could ignore that event. This is really implementation details discussions and not about the result. So I don't think honestly I I hope this this is not going to deep into should the event be there or not because this is should be more about is the user expectation met or not and uh, the event can be a detail and uh, the whatever they can do with the uh, uh, functions after that's what matters to me yeah um, yeah so i i think because we're we're, we're we're 45 minutes into the meeting and i uh, i just want to make sure that martin you 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 talk about your yes. your so your when yeah, so there's just a quick thing. So the reason that I use the underscore there for my it's just a it's just a pattern I've started doing because what I would normally call I would normally call this like when subscribe. Button. It's fine. It's just a, a lambda that is. A, yeah, exactly, a, a exactly. Line. Yeah, yeah. A, a multi-line lambda has an underscore. That's, yeah, exactly. That's um, right. So the, the the original thing was right. So say uh, the my original request came about because okay, this is how we do whens. 
But then I had um, some objects that also had some events that happened to them. And it was a channel idea, the idea that on a channel, I've got a channel object and I can subscribe to this channel and I can send messages on a channel, I can unsubscribe, right? And I want to let other people know when either a message has been received or I've been subscribed, whatever, and it's not just channels, right? It's anything, but I've got some Python object that has events. And so the goal of this was, and let's go to, was I want to, I want to be able to use when to, to handle this. So when I, let me, let me, I'm scrolling, I know I'm, scrolling around so where's my channel okay so this is my original goal right so channel as a winnable i want to be able to say when somebody subscribes to my channel call this in the, in exactly the same way and when someone has sent a message on the channel in this case i do want my event right and and then when someone's un unsubscribed from my channel do this so basically we wanted to be able to treat python objects and obviously python objects would be something that say wraps the speech synthesis or the sound. So any Python object, we want to have make those winnable as well, not just DOM objects. And we want it to all quack the same so that our, our PyScript app creators are presented with a consistent notion of when something happens to this thing, do this, right? And whatever, you know, I'm not worried about the order of how we say those sentences, but that's the idea. No, the, is to order, make the order matters because the order can be the the disambiguation order. So, it, yeah, if, no, you but, want, if you but, want an event type, like when unsubscribe channel, that's that that's something that we can work around because uh, we we can understand the thing. The the first thing is not hello. Uh, that's the only question you we, we can have to say okay it's a string and it has been like this until now so when click selector instead of when selector yes, click yes. so, so and, this could, so this could be all i'm saying all i'm saying is that if you want the disambiguation for events that's that's the thing to me so yeah. you you have so, um when event name as a string and then and, and and then you can forget about winnables because or, or or not because you can still use either winnables or callbacks and uh functions or definitions or however you want to call it so that's the disambiguation that that to me is important so when we have a when we can say that the first argument of the when is a string you clearly want an event if that's not a string, you clearly have a winnable or or vice okay. versa. Okay, so hang on, hang on, hang on. Andrea, let let let. Yeah, he's he. Uh, Martin's got all this covered. Martin, do you want to? Yeah, yeah. Let's 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 move on because yeah. At the end of the day, we can we can handle it. It's up to us, right? We've yeah. got, we've got the pack. So, so that, I've that, got, that's I've only got... rule, right? When click uh, selector, when click this, when click that. So Wait, that's can all. I, can so I just go through all this? All can can I just go through the example right so I've, I've got two cases so the things in the test cases didn't the thing about the test case was it doesn't show attaching multiple handlers to the same winnable right so that was so it was slightly artificial in that sense right so so what I was thinking was okay if we wanted it to look like we want it now like like you just said um, um, Andrea so if I want to say um, I create some object, it fires these events, and I want to listen listen to it. So yeah, that's a one subscribe channel. So these are this, so this is invert order. Because yeah, you are a, a, expecting an event. Yes, yes. So, well, no, no, no. But this is so. Uh, this is the beauty, right? So the beauty of the when protocol is also its uh, its issue, right? Is that no, it's not an issue. It's a protocol. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. No, no, but, but, but this is we've got to decide it though. No, but this this is I'm actually using it. Even. Hang on, hang on, folks. Let's, let, we're we're talking over each other too much. And uh, so the thing is, I can I can use the winnable protocol to do what my my first cut at this right was like when now your 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 first when channel hang on hang on andrea 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 no, 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 no. hang on that's important that's important that's when channel dot subscribe that's not when channel comma subscribe that's right. when channel not subscribe or okay. when subscribe 
and, and Andrea, please, Andrea, please, I'm getting there for the love of God. Yeah. I'm, okay. He, he's he's got all this covered. Let let just let Martin. Okay. For the next ten minutes, I Martin. Ta- yeah. Exactly. Ta- ta- I, I, okay. I've, I've, I've written I've written a couple of examples to experiment as to how with this could or might look. Right. So the first one, I'm presenting this as. Imagine I wanted to, because again, for me, what does it come down to? I'm modeling objects. I'm modeling something in the real world. Real world things fire events. And I want to react to that thing when it fires events. And for example, so for my channel, may fire multiple multiple events. Now, the interesting thing about the use of the when protocol, which I think is really powerful, it's kind of, it's it's always also a danger, right? Yeah. Is it allows me I can create this channel as winnable, right? So if we looked at a channel, this is one implementation that I could do, right? So first of all, I got the idea of a winnable. So I can implement the idea of winnable. It implements the when protocol. It manages the idea of an event type by looking in the first argument and treating it as an event type. Remember, the goal is I'm trying to model an object that fires multiple events, right? That's the goal, right? Um, and so here I can do it this way. So I model, I, I manage my list of listeners. I can add and remove listeners. I can dispatch an event, right? So now my channel, if I've implement, if I've chosen to implement it this way, I've got some channel, it's got a name. So subscribe, each of these things would be dot, 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 do whatever your underlying object needs to actually do some work. And then the goal of the events is, right? Fundamental goal of events is, by the way, let the world know that um, someone has subscribed. Let the world know that I've sent a message or got a message and let the world know that someone has unsubscribed, right? So I can implement my channel object as by as a subclass of my winnable. And in that case, it looks like this, right? So then my channel as a winnable looks like this. I implement my channel. I say when channel subscribe, when channel message, when channel this, everything works fine. We're all good to go, right? So if I come over here and I go, yay, everything works. Then we've got Andrea, which is what you're talking about, which is, okay, so say I'm still trying to model the same object, but it's it's still got the same three events, but I want to use the the events themselves. So then I make, but again, an event still needs to have multiple listeners to it, right? So my winnable, so I've got this notion of event looks suspiciously like a a winnable, only it, it never needs to worry about different other events, right? So this only has to manage a list of listeners. Same thing, it's going to call back all my listeners. And on the when protocol, now I just add the event listener. So now when I've got my channel with events, I can just actually say, oh, there's a subscribe event, a message event, an unsubscribe event. And then the subscribe again, this would be do whatever it is that you need to do to send to subscribe, blah, blah, blah. Do whatever you need to do to unsubscribe, right? And then, so then if I do this version with events, now I do this when channel.subscribe event. This is the, this is the actual um, winnable object, which I subscribe to, right? And so I come down here and I can use the actual channel with events, run my example again, and you'll see, okay, wait, surprisingly enough, it all works, right? (laughs) It all works in exactly the same way. My point of this was to show the two different ways of potentially how you could do what I wanted to do, which was use the winnable. But then the other thing that it showed up was, for me, this, the smell is this, right? I'm doing, and again, this is the only reason I care about the order, not the order that it comes in, but that the order is consistent. Here I'm saying when event target, some reference to discover the target. And here I'm saying when target event. And even in the other case, I'm saying when kind of combined <laughs> but still when target comes first and my only thought was my only concern was can we make that um, consistent listen now the other thing is there's nothing stopping us writing it still right the, we could write the, the the signature of the um of the when decorator such that it always takes the, the, the event the, name the event comes first the the event target comes second. Now, if the event target is a string, then I'll use it as a query selector. If it's a DOM element, I'll attach it to that. If it's an, if it implements, or if it implements the when protocol, 
I'll attach it to that. So we can choose the order. I'm not, and again, I don't care if we change it. I'm just obviously, if we change it, I just, I just care that it's yeah. consistent with every other uses of, of when. Yeah. So the when protocol is really, the idea of the when protocol, I think is really powerful. The, the Achilles heel of it is that like, for, like this just showed, we've got, and, and maybe that's the power of it, right? Is in your test case, Nicholas, you chose to use the term trigger. Yeah. Right. To fire an event. And I chose to use the word dispatch event. Yeah. Actually, Claude, Claude chose it because Claude wrote the code. Right? Yeah. Um, but but the, but it but it does make that the when the when protocol is made is way more powerful. But it just made made me realize that, OK, well, if we're using it inside PyScript, we should be consistent with how we yes. use that. Not, it's not trigger versus yes. oh this object has a trigger and this has an ad event this yeah time. that was so that that was all yeah and Dre you can go now go now <laughs> okay so so hang on a second let me just rearrange my screen so that we, we're seeing the right things so cool okay first of all thank you for all your patience okay for everybody those listening and those explaining next thing Martin that was wonderful what you just did because uh, you segued into exactly the point that I want to get to, which is the kind of the, th the thing that I've been thinking about this afternoon when I've been looking at my code. OK, and if I may, I'm just going to share my screen and show you some signatures, function call signatures. And we can talk about and I think this is going to speak to what Andrea has been talking about, how the event comes first and then the thing comes second and blah, 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 blah. Uh, we can we can figure that out. OK, so. Um, let me just share my screen. Uh, bu -bu -bums. The other thing I'd like us to do, right, is actually build, as I was saying to you earlier, Nicholas, yeah. like, if we build the geolocation and we build the sound yes. and we build real life, real use cases, as opposed to, hey, let's just make up some use cases. Yeah. And I think it will help. I, well. I, I agree. So I, uh, so this is what we were talking about earlier on. Okay. And so underneath, you'll have something like this. Uh, so uh, when self and then oh, I can't type, then you'll have event name. You, you, oh, man, handler. And then yeah, basically, it's it's figure. Yeah, okay. And down here is just oh, I wish the AI would just shut up and go. Oh, man. I'm pressing tab. No. There we go. That's it. So when looks like that. And then what we're doing here is at when, um, for instance, click. Yeah. My button. Uh, def foo the event. And then uh, whatever. OK. But uh, that this when decorator is ultimately calling this when done to when protocol function whenable. This is the thing that makes it winnable. Um, and so inside here, you know, it's understanding it's getting a click name. Now, a, 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 an event name called click. Now, this could be something like, for instance, uh, location. And then we have a geo uh, object uh, that is winnable. OK, so. Uh, so that could be the geolocation API. And then in here, we might have an if event name equals location, then do uh, do the stuff you need so that uh, the uh, event is dispatched uh, that eventually gets sent to foo, which gives you your longitude and latitude. So you might go long longitude. Yeah, exactly. Something, <laughs> something less like this. This is you know, co-pilot making stuff up here, but it, 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 it'll do because it, it's kind of close enough. OK, but I could also easily just have had click and, uh, and a CSS selector. The advantage of this way is that I can do my CSS selector. So the old API works the same way. OK, um, and then when we're using when as a function, we're going to be doing something like this. When location, um, and not button, but we call it the, the, you know, we get the geo, the geo thing. And then I'm going to say handler equals foo. 
and um, or the, then the third argument is going to be the reference to the handler, and then I've got x equals one, you know, whatever the, the the args and the quarks that might be passed into the dunderwen as well. That's essentially the idea that I think addresses what Andrea was talking about, and just gives us a, conc a concrete example of Martin what where you had got to by the end of your presentation. So uh, let me just stop sharing the screen, and then we can kind of. Uh, I, I Keep the screen up there. Keep the screen up. Okay, go for it. Yeah. So, so I think so. The ben <laughs> so this is obviously somewhat very similar to what I was like. The yeah. downside, the thing that the reason that I like the WEN protocol and I'm saying that's worth looking at. The thing that this doesn't give, which Andrea's approach gives, is the ability for the events to actually pass. I could patch, you know, longitude, latitude into my event thing. I wouldn't have, be have this the data wouldn't necessarily be hidden in an opaque event data structure, which is what the winnable idea from Andrea had. So you, would, so you would have something like uh, at uh, when uh, geo dot longitude, if you just happened to... Well, no, no. So you could say, no, what I'm saying is you could say geo dot location, but then my event handler, foo, I think, Andrea, this is one of the benefits of that approach, was I could actually say foo takes a longitude and latitude as arguments. Uh, yeah, but you could still you could still say that here. Yes. Uh, well, except we're passing a single event, right? Yeah, we are a, a context. Yes. Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm saying. Instead of grouping it, Andrea. Uh, Andrea, you've been very patient. Do you want me to keep my screen up, or uh, I don't know? It's, it has nothing to do with your screen, so maybe you can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it's good to see when people are discussing. Sorry for my improvised setup. Um, it, this is about what Martin said earlier. Um, real world things fire events. And here I tend to disagree because they don't really fire events, they fire callbacks. And so it's it's all about so events are callbacks because events cannot exist without callbacks so what we're trying to do here is to simplify the callback handling uh, and 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 i think you, what you what you meant to say is that real words fight fire callbacks by name which is a more uh, accurate description of how things work. You have a name for an event, type in JavaScript word is always even dot type, and a reaction. So that's an event name and a callback act, act, acting uh, about that. And um, in this case, there are a lot of things that can be simplified, like when you say, I want to say the event name and then the CSS selector, how about you have a dumb CSS selector dot click or dot name or dot event or dot event type? Because that's the thing that we have been discussing for, for a while right now. And I think this is still not fully understood. And probably with the um, Nicolas latest winnable uh, interface I can demo next time uh, something that makes sense so when you're worried about the order or I want just a name or a type or an event name event name is always something that you can provide and uh, it, it's just about what does it mean for winnables and winnables can be automated and so you don't have to care about all these details that you describe as uh, one uh, uh, an event name and a selector and who cares i mean we can solve all of that with ease and we can also provide backward compatibility which it can be uh temporary uh, i mean if you pass a type and a selector in into the at when that means that the uh, decorator is being used for legacy purposes. We can work with that because we can decide that, yeah, that works because two strings, one is a type, a event type, and one is a selector, 
and we can transform that until we don't want to do that anymore. So I don't see, all I'm trying to say is that I haven't seen a single reason for not moving forward with the current uh, proposal from Nicholas and that that we can grant backward compatibility so that parting expectations won't break and uh, our expectation can move forward. So why cannot we have both but we need to agree on the fact that any event is a dot event name away or a something square brackets even name so, away and we we can do that and and, so and what is that's that's my question and i have nothing else to add so, so uh martin do you want to answer that question because I, I i have a few yeah. sort of yeah well, but really it's just a question really right so the thing is the dot event name really doesn't matter to me right the the, the point of that is that we're making we've got some object which represents the event. So the winnable in this case is a representation of an event, right? So it means that we would still have to come up with a default implementation of what that winnable should look like such that, because it's not, it, the thing is, and the other thing is, so because it's not callbacks, right? So objects fire events. I'm talking about it in the completely abstract modeling of real world applications, right? They fire events whether or not anyone's listening. That's the difference, right? It's not a callback. It's like a callback that doesn't exist. So events can be fired and no one can be listening and that's fine because that's the real world that like my, my engine's running, it's running, it's backfires. The engine is running, See, it you backfires. See you later. See you later. And, and so that's that's the modeling of that's the real world modeling aspect of it, right? If it, it, those events get fired, no one can listen. If if we just want if we just say use callbacks, right? Then a callback for me is something like is a very is a very singular thing. If I've got if I use for example the speech synthesis API and I say whatever it, I can't remember it is now. There's one of them, right? It has yeah. on finished or on spoke on started, oh, right? The difference sorry, is Martin. Like, sorry, Martin. The difference. sorry, Martin. Just one thing. You're talking about callback, no one is listening. But the moment you use the when decorator is meaning you're you're setting a callback, somebody got a listen yes, to. Yes, but otherwise it doesn't work, right? Yes, so but, you but, are already already defining a callback for yes, the when difference I mean that so please let's not say you can have events nobody's listening to because the when decorator is all about defining events somebody wants to listen to. So yes, let's but start the, from scratch from this, right? No, no, but the, but the thing is, I define my I define the model of my model of the world whether or not I care anyone's listening. You as a user, I, of, well, agree, I define, agree. So you can listen to something that will never happen, but that's not on you. That's on implementation no, no. Like, of the geolocation it's, for for. It's, for for argument's sake, we're we are talking about the de a decoration to define callbacks that listen to something. So no, the okay. argument about not listening should be dropped out no. of the equation. I think. No, no, no. no. I, 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 Absolutely disagree. The idea of, a, of an object firing an event that no one's listening, you're turning it the other way around. Hang on a second, folks. Folks, folks, folks. We're not going to get anywhere. Uh, it's good that there's passion in the. It's good if there's passion in the room. But we no, should no, let no, each no, other. No, we should no, let each other yeah, speak. About a listener definition. When the creator is a listener definition, we cannot talk about the object that don't fire events. We we are talking about a listener definition. You are listening to something that yeah. you want to listen to. So there's no there's no parentheses around the object not firing events. You are listening to that object because Say, the when the creator is about listening to stuff, right? I hope we agree about yeah. the when the creator is all about listening. Yes, agree. Yeah, yeah, yes, yes. But I think we, we've got our wires crossed here. And Martin, would you like to explain? Uh, and and yeah. let's let 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 Martin just explain a bit more. So imagine, my, take my channel object. I've modeled the real world of a of a channel, right? It fires messages where it fires um, events when a subscription is made to that channel. It fires a subscript um, an event when people unsubscribe from that channel and it also fires an event when someone sends a message on that channel right this is our pub sub thing right now me as a user of my channel object 
I actually might not care. I don't care with it. It can be firing subscribe events all it likes, right? And, and, and if I don't care, if all I'm actually interested in is the messages on that channel, that's all I listen to. Right. But my but 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 my object is merrily firing those just just like um, buttons, potentially well, it depends on the implementation. Right. Buttons could well be firing click events, whether or not I'm listening to it. Buttons fire. There's mouse over events, whether or not I'm listening to it. There's a difference between a fundamental difference between a callback and an event is by nature. If I attach a callback to something like the, the speech synthesis, I can attach one callback to that. The idea of event systems is that they allow you to add multiple listeners to the same thing. And that's the difference. And so my, the point of this when decorator was to, we've already got this notion of when, which allows me to add multiple listeners to a particular thing happening to an object. Why not extend that to the notion of Python objects? So the callback is not the same as an event. Yeah, so you, you, you are adding listeners by in a string typing the event name right so let's say your channel you want to subscribe whatever you you you, you type a, so you at when and you your first argument is the event name so here we are basically saying that's gonna work but at the same time you can move that string event name into dot event name what where's the difference in in terms of same idea or or whatever so you you have a winnable that you can you don't need to have a a, a class that's a winnable you can have a class that has an uh, dunder item or dunder at that provides a winnable when you say class reference dot channel dot subscribe square brackets channel ID or or anything like that so where is the difficulty in there to say okay we can have um, a simpler API where, where is not, that that's the, the I, thing I don't understand the thing that yes because you I don't if we choose if I, if we choose that syntax I'm fine with it Andrea that's the thing which you don't you've been missing I think that's the miscommunication I don't want to I don't want I, you to be fine with that. I'm just asking, what's, I, what is it that makes it less comfortable or, for you? Because I, for or, me, it's like having a, 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 a more explicit approach in, instead of string-based approach. So for me, it's like an improvement instead. Yes. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, we, I, we, can, I, I, we, we can agree to disagree in there. I don't care. It's just I, I, what is it that makes you confident that a string has a even so, name better than any dot even name so the, or square brackets in sorry so so the um you're right there's there's an absolute downside to the strings being names because it means that they're this kind of very opaque easily easily to make errors in my my request for this was really about finding a consistent solution such that when i use for dom of it, the whole point of this was when i was doing it was like when I'm when I'm typing and I'm doing my DOM events, why do I do it differently? So the other thing about um, the interesting thing about our current DOM events, right, is that when I say when something, my selector could reference multiple objects. Yeah, so you can when DOM selector dot click and you have your callback. And so that's okay. So that's the question that I have. If you look at the screen that I'm sharing here, so you're saying, how do I do the selector then? Hash button is how I would normally do it, and then you're saying dot click. Is that what you're saying, Andrea? I don't know. I don't. I don't. I'm, I'm trying to see your your screen, and uh, it, it doesn't. <laughs> It's not coming up. Um, uh, what to do? Uh, and the thing is, the thing is, though. So wait, wait. wait. I, I can have a, a preview, but I can't see it. Uh, so if you could, if you if you put your mouse over it, uh, you should be able to make that full screen. No, it's not about that. Uh, it's just showing squares 
uh, walking around. Um, I'm sorry, don't, don't, it's not working for me. So yeah. I don't, I don't okay. This is making it difficult, then, isn't it? Yeah, I don't. I don't. I, I don't see your screen. So that's all I'm saying. And, yeah. Uh, Makes no sense so, so I have a, so I, I, I yeah. Already out of time and, uh, yeah, yeah, we are running out of time. I want to make be respectful of people's time. I also want to make sure that um, uh, we get the conversation to a good place. And I, the the thing that interests me is consistency. And I think you know, uh, I I don't want to speak for anybody else, but I imagine Martin would say something like, "I, I really don't care what we put <laughs> in the when arguments." So long as it's consistent, okay? And, it's and consistent right for the old API, it's consistent for the old API, or for consistent for the what we want. Well, that's the that's that's yeah, okay. So exactly, oh. Andrea. That's that's what I was just about to ask because the old API is if like so as the as the as you two as the PyScript maintainers, right? Your choice to support old APIs is I, I don't care about what the old API is, right? If you give me a new API. I want it to, all I say is I just want it to be consistent and I want to be able to say when, I want to be able to capture the notion of when something happens in a consistent way. That's all like, that's what this feature request was, right? Yeah. And so even, even though, for okay. example, I'm, okay. well, you, so, sorry, you, I can see, I can on, see Nicola's screen eventually. Ah. So, so like line, so line 30, like we could, we can use a get at a right to create a winnable for you on channel dot subscribe. But if you looked at the code I showed you, right, again, that's that's losing the benefit of um, of necessary so explicit. That's just a, that's an implementation helper, right? We still have to, and and so whether or not like you did what I did, right, which was that's why I declared an event subclass so that at the top of my object definition i could say channel and um, the subscribe event is an event object so it's the winnable there so it's explicit either i explicitly list it or i have it come into being automatically um they're okay, all options. Okay. Uh, martin i i don't have so i need more context about your your channel but uh, in nicola's screen i'm seeing what's wrong with the line 35 to you and to me, it's wrong because it's a string and string dot click. Yeah. No sense. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. So imagine, that imagine that's not string dot click, but that's when DOM selector dot click. Yeah. Uh, around the string. Around. Yeah. No, I, yeah. Yeah. I have no. I have no problem with that, right? If that, if you if you did something to make it, like there's two there's two issues for me, right? There's the consistency and ease of use from an application writer's point of view. And then there's the consistency and ease of use from an object create an object modeler point of view, right? The person who writes in the channel and the person that's using the channel. It's like they're the two things that I just just think you just got to be make sure we care. How do I create a channel that has these events? And what's the best way? And because um, obviously the when protocol, as I showed in that previous example, the when protocol leaves it, the beauty of it right it leaves multiple ways for me to interpret what when and what a winnable is but yes but it's for mostly for subscriber or consumer of your channel right your channel doesn't need a when decorator your channel rather need okay your channel might need a when decorator for uh, incoming let's say incoming messages it doesn't need to use the when well, decorator for for exposing things it's like it needs to expose possible decorators when it comes to sorry not decorators uh, yeah, possible like, winnables when it comes to subscribers but not when it comes to um, yeah there's, there's three there's three things you can currently listen to on our channels right it lets you know when someone else has subscribed to it so for example if you're doing the chat room you could say oh john's arrived and it lets you know when someone's left and it lets you know when someone send a message right so there's three different events that potentially right are how i could choose to implement my channel so look I, i'm very aware of the time because i'm looking at the amount of uh disk oh, space wow. this is using uh hey. for, for recording the video um and we've been at it about an hour and a half now <laughs> Yeah. So, uh, th so uh, what I would what I would suggest, I'm just going to stop sharing my screen so that we can see everybody talking because I want to make sure that we're, uh, you know, we are respectful of 
folks time and and things i I mean this is this is an interesting discussion um and i i don't think we've kind of quite got there yet i would i would like to ask if we could put this sort of discussion the outcomes of these discussions from our different points of view on the ticket in github in the discussion um so that we can start to refine those ideas there uh andrea sorry i see you've got your hand up I just want to apologize to Martin because I asked him before. We, we had the discussion before and um, today we had more details, I think. Um, and I asked him to, to provide some example and he did. And uh, unfortunately, I had other issues to, to, to tackle and I didn't, I didn't spend enough time to go through all your extra details and requirements and formulate better answer and uh, and Nicholas is actually working on the ticket so I think we we should all agree that this needs some uh, <laughs> overall agreement of what we are doing and what we are shipping because otherwise it, it, it might make yeah. any one of us disappointed and I think all of us have the same idea of what we want it's just the way we want it has to be the easiest for users and the best for us. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Square, yeah, I, square. I, I, I think <laughs> At least I, that's my that's my idea. And, and, and sorry, Martin, uh, again. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no worries. No worries. I, I think for me, like I said, for me, it's making sure we take into account the high level notion. So, like I just said, like the the idea of okay, what do I? What's the burden that we're asking for object writers, like someone like me writing the channel? How does that look to them to create this? Because again, like I said, fundamentally, we're modeling the real world where I've got a channel, events happen, right? So how do I model it? And then, okay, as a user of my channel, what's the burden on the user of my channel? What do they have to do? And making sure that's what we're aiming at, right? It's like, there's two different kinds of people, like, how do we do this? And then that's, uh, and then looking at like, then there's the issues of, do we care about backward compatibility? Can we handle backward compatibility? But, but you know, that but that part is up to you guys, how much pain mm. you want to manage, right? Do, you, do, do we care? Do we want to move forward? Um, and so for me, they're kind of separate issues. It's like, it's those burdens. And that's why I think I really want to look at, like, let's, let's instead of test cases like channels, which are fairly like, they're, they're in my, happen to be in my current domain of work, because I'm working on them, but why not? Let's do the sound. Let's do the geolocation. What's it look like? How does that? How would that look with a, yeah. with this implementation? Because yeah, like I said, yeah. the beauty of it, the when protocol part to me, the beauty of it was, like I said, I showed you two completely different implementations. One which used a bait, an abstract class which could have been renamed event target, right? Like J- JavaScript, and it behaved like event target. The other one used you declared the individual events, but they were both using the exact same winnable the when protocol right and that's so that's the beauty of the when protocol it allows us to do we can implement all kinds of stuff and then the actual syntax and the signature of the arguments that's the least of my worries right yeah. it's like so i think here's my suggestion and again we're coming up to an hour and a half in about a minute and 30 seconds uh uh my suggestion is let's try and figure out some concrete examples um from the browser API from using the DOM, from using uh, user created objects that need to quack like a winnable, for instance, the channels that you were talking about, Martin, and we stick them on that uh, GitHub ticket so that we've got concrete examples of things that folks want to do with this when thing. Whilst remembering, what we want is a very easy way for folks who are used to using Python in a synchronous way to decorate or specify this block of code runs when this thing happens. Now, this thing happens, how we define that between the parentheses of the when decorator, that, as Martin, you said, that's up, that's that's down to us, okay? Yeah. That's an that's a implementation detail. But I think, uh, and, uh, and this is speaking to Andrea, um, we all agree. I mean, everybody's th- 
putting their thumbs up. I mean, it makes me feel really nice. Oh, uh, you know, this is th- this thrust is how how we all want to um, for it to work. But as always, the devil's in the details, and the only way we're going to get to those devils and details <laughs> is by actually looking at concrete examples from the real world. Uh, imagining, you know, using the AP, you know, can we create some code? Uh, that we would imagine wraps the geo API or the speech API or the audio API or or uh, I want to do a, a thing that is attached to a whole series of buttons because I'm using a CSS selector and it's working on the mouse over event or something like that. So that uh, and then you've got your channels thing that you've created yourself in Python that needs to be winnable as well. So let let's put that on the ticket and then we can refine pick it apart we can look at the details we can figure out where the devils are we can squash them with the hammer uh, or kill them with the donkey or whatever it is that we want to do uh and uh and then then we at least can agree on a consensus of because of this 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 and this this is the way forward um and we can all see why this is this happened the final thing i wanted to say was there's an aesthetic aspect to this as well, right? Python's a beautiful looking language because Guido's genius was we're going to recode more than we write it, okay? And it would be lovely if we th- we make sure that that aesthetic element of creating an API is 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 a part of this process because I know in the past when I've done API development with the micro bit stuff, we we concentrated a lot on that. You know, when you read the API. Does it actually tell you what it's doing and things like that? Uh, Andrea, you've got your hand up. You can have the final say, matey. Uh, we we broke the API a few times already. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and the WAN, I think, to present their backward compatibility as much as it can. Yeah. And uh, I will do that too. So yeah. yeah. Everything you say plus not breaking what's <laughs> working right now. That, that, that's, a whole, that's a whole that's a whole load of pain, isn't it? <laughs> oh, yeah, man. but it's not it's not difficult. If, if if we get the new API right, it's actually trivial to preserve the backward compatibility. Yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah, I agree. Yeah, I agree. Awesome. I agree. Okay, so it feels again like Teletubbies. Big hugs all around, um, and this is why I'm an engineer. It's for discussions like this. There's passion in the room, and uh, we're going to solve a problem together, and that's a good thing to do. So I'm going to stop the video recording.